1 Samuel 30 in your Bibles, please. Today we are going to finish the, the book of 1 Samuel proper. And I say it that way. Over the next five weeks, we are still going to uh, be in 1 Samuel in a manner of speaking. We're finishing the text today as far as exposition is concerned. And then over the next five weeks, next week, we're going to uh, consider the concept of being a man after God's own heart. What that means and how that touches us today. Something we hear about quite often uh, in broader evangelicalism. The fact that David was a man after God's own heart, being a man after God's own heart. But what does it mean? And how do we become one of those? And how, what does it mean for us? And then uh, the next four weeks after that, we're going to talk about various psalms uh, that connect to David's, uh, the events of David's life uh, in 1 Samuel. Our first 1 Samuel message began on January 11th of last year. So the series has taken us just a little bit over a year, including all of the extra things that come up. In the book, we have traced the history of three men, primarily. And if you recall our outline, the outline traced the history of three men. First man was Samuel. And then it transitioned to Saul. And then it transitioned to David. And as we've walked through this book, we have seen, if I can put it this way, men at their most human, right? It's a very human book. We don't just see victory. We see defeat. We don't just see obedience. We see disobedience. We talked last week about truth and how important truth is. And we, we, we saw the various times in David's life where he lied and the consequences of his lies. And how important it is that we be people of truth. Samuel was a godly man. He spent so much time, however, with his ministry that he lost his family, right? Saul was a man who had every advantage. But he tried to bear the weight of the kingdom on his own shoulders rather than trusting God to speak and lead him. And his attempt to lead God's people his way eventually drove him mad. David was a humble shepherd whose faith in God and understanding of his own limits and God's unlimited power brought him great success. Though some failures as he took his eyes off of God and he stopped listening to God. And this week, we're going to consider in 1 Samuel 30 and 31, we'll cover the two chapters, we're going to consider a final contrast between David and Saul as it pertains to this understanding of, of these two men and their character. Next week, we'll contrast them again as we talk about being a man after God's own heart title of the message, Two Men, Two Directions, Two Results. The man David, a man who simply stayed the course, did what he does, trusted the Lord, did what was right. The man Saul, ignoring God's word, taking the kingdom on his shoulders, doing it his way, and failing. Not only failing himself, but failing his family and failing his kingdom. In chapter 30, we consider David once again. Recall last time we, we encountered David, we saw him at so the beginning of chapter 29, and he was following the king of Gath, Achish, he was following him into battle. And this battle was going to be against the Philistine, or the, 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 the nation of Israel. He was going with the Philistines to fight against the nation of Israel. When they got to the battlefield, however, we recall, the other Philistine leaders, the princes of the Philistines, refused to let David take part in that battle. And they refused to let him take part in the battle because they said, well, if David has made himself ugly in the eyes of Israel, then certainly the best way he can get back in their good graces is to turn on us in the middle of the battle, right? So we're not going to, we don't want that to happen. Send David send his men away. And that's where we pick up. David has been sent away from the battle now with his 600 men. And they are on their way back to the place where David and his men lived, the city that Achish had given them, the city of Ziklag. And the text tells us, it came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day, and um, that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag and smitten Ziklag and burned it with fire and had taken the women captives that were therein. They slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away 
and went on their way. So the men returned to their city, to the city of Ziklag, and they find the city burned, their houses ransacked, their families taken captive. The text is careful to mention that um, nobody was killed, that they didn't kill the people in Ziklag, they only took them captive. And notice who the enemy is on this one, the Amalekites. This is one of the people groups that David had been pillaging for the last 18 months while he's been in the Philistines' land, right? Uh, the Amalekites were one of the primary names mentioned as, as people groups that David had been attacking. So here, it probably has a little something to do with why they attacked Ziklag, particularly as it was completely defenseless at the time. Now, I'm not going to walk through every verse on the, on the screen today because we've got two chapters to get through, but uh, do uh, keep your Bibles open and follow along with me. The Bible says in verse 4 that the men lifted up their voices and wept until they had no more power to weep. It details that David's two wives, Ahinoam and Abigail, had been taken along with everyone else. And the people were so angry at this turn of events. They were so angry with, with the, the fact that the whole army went with David to this battle, only to not fight the battle, only to come back and to find their city destroyed and their families taken and their possessions taken, that they actually spoke about stoning David with stones. Now, this was not rational. David could not have known. But, you know, often when we're in grief, we're not very rational, are we? When we are grieved, we think and do and say things that we would not otherwise say if we haven't, as our memory verse says this morning, brought our thoughts into captivity. And so these men are actually speaking about stoning David for this circumstance. At the end of verse 6, however, the text tells us that David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. And this is what we see David do. Oftentimes, in Scripture, we find teaching that reminds us that God is in control. When things don't go our way or seem out of control, we serve a God who is in control. Nothing catches God off guard. Uh, nothing is unexpected to our Lord. And in these times, we have one of two choices. We either abandon our hope in God and we fall back upon ourselves. That's what his men did. They, they got upset and they said, how can we solve this problem? Well, it's not going to solve this problem, but it might make us feel better to stone David. Or we can infold into God. We can fling ourselves upon his mercy. We keep doing what we know is right. We seek his face for leading and guidance. And we trust that if the circumstance at hand didn't take God by surprise, then surely his grace can lead us through it. So David encouraged himself in the Lord. He chose to do right. He didn't ab abandon God's will and way. And instead he sought out God's will and way. So he calls for Abiathar the priest and he asks him to bring the ephod with him. And in verse 8 the text says this, David inquired at the Lord saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he, that's the Lord, answered him, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them and without fail recover all. So David, in, in his attempts to encourage himself in the Lord, lest uh, he become, lest he despair, but then as well seeking to know what to do next, which is also something that's very difficult to do in circumstances, he sought the Lord. He went to the Lord. He said, God, what would you have me to do? And wouldn't you know it? God answered him. God has always answered him when he sought the Lord. God would have answered Saul if he would have sought the Lord. And this is what we see is that as the men of God seek the Lord, God is faithful to answer. And he's still faithful today. He's still faithful to lead us, to guide us in the way that we should go. He's still faithful to give us the direction that we ought to take. If we will but seek him in the times of fear, if we will but seek him in the unknowns, if we will but seek him in our times of grief. How often in our times of grief have we flung ourselves on anything other than the Lord? Anything other than the Lord for guidance? Anything other than the Lord for, for uh, comfort? And yet David is such a stellar example here. His wives are gone. He, his life is being threatened. He has led these men and, and this is what has happened. But he can't bear that burden on his own. Nor did God want him to bear that burden. 
So he lays the burden on the Lord. He trusts the Lord, and then he says, okay, God, what's next? And God was faithful to give him what's next. So God says, go, and you will recover all. David and his 600 men pursue, the text tells us. Verse 9 tells us that of these 600 men, likely all of whom had loved ones, as they got to the brook Besor, as they got to a brook, 200 of those 600 men remained there. They could not go any farther, whether it was just through grief or, or the great deal of travel or perhaps both. These men were physically incapable of going on. And so David left them. He, and he left them with the stuff. This would have been not just beneficial to those men who were not in a, a state of mind with which to be able to pursue and to fight, but it probably would have been beneficial to the army as a whole, right? Because not only are you not having to be, be dealing with these 200 exhausted men, they, they can rest and you can move faster, but they can also stay, stay with the stuff and make you lighter and you, you can do what you need to do. So they leave 200 men and the 400 men plus David go to pursue their enemies. Verse 11 tells us that as they followed the enemies, they found an Egyptian in the field who had been a servant of the Amalekites. They gave this Egyptian food and water. He was in, in, in no condition to, to speak or, or anything at the time, but they gave him food and water. They let him rest. And after Afterwards, he told his story. And what he tells them is that three days prior, he had fallen sick. And he was a servant of the Amalekites. He'd fallen sick, and uh, the, his Amalekite master, not wanting to be slowed down or inconvenienced by him, simply left him behind without any help, without any substance, su sustenance, just kind of dumped him in the field, and, and they moved on their way. So for three days, he had been lying in that field ill, and... Um, David and his men found him and, and nourished him and got him to a place where he was able to, to speak and to function. Through this servant, they learned that this group of Amalekites that had dumped him was the same men that had burned and ransacked Ziklag, as well as many other cities uh, in that area. So he, as he tells this story, David says, we'd like you to lead us to these men. And the servant says, I'll do so on the condition that, number one, you don't kill me. And number two, you don't deliver me back into the hand of my master. So this was a, a fair trade. Master had abandoned him. David doesn't kill him. They get the location of this army. Verse 16 tells us the Amalekites, when they got to the encampment, the Amalekites were spread throughout the earth. They were eating, they were drinking, they were dancing. They were generally celebrating the spoil that they had received. Certainly they were in no position to fight, and they were also not in any condition to fight. They were probably in various uh, degrees of inebriation. Uh, they were relaxed, they were not armed, they were not ready to go for battle. And so we read in verse 17 of chapter 30, And David smote them from the twilight even until the evening of the next day. And there escaped not a man of them, save 400 young men which rode upon camels and fled. And David recovered all that the Amalekites carried away, and David rescued his two wives. And there was nothing lacking to them, neither small nor great, neither sons nor daughters, neither spoil nor anything that they had taken to them. David recovered all, and David took all the flocks and all the herds which they drave before those other cattle and said, this is David's spoil. So not only did they recover their families through this battle, but they recovered everything, every spouse, every child, even their possessions. And the Amalekites, of course, had spoiled other cities as well, right? So, so they didn't just get their spoil back, but they received all of the other stuff that the Amalekites had taken and effectively increased all of their wealth greatly through this battle. In verse 20, the Bible tells us David took his portion as the leader and then the rest would be divided between the men. So uh, we have a situation now where all of uh, everything has been recovered. David and his men are now returning to Ziklag. And the 400 men come back to the 200 that had stayed back with the stuff, that had been too exhausted to go on. And as they begin to divide the spoil, the, a part of the men, a part of the 400 men that had fought in the battle, those that had continued with David and been a part of the battle, uh, 
those men being called in this passage men of Belial, which that word, of course, we know means worthlessness or, or vanity or, or um, wickedness, those men began to complain. And they complained because they said, hey, look, we are, were part of the 400 that were strong enough to go with you. Why should those 200 get a part of the spoil if they didn't fight the battle? They said, let's just give them back their families, give them back the minimum, and then send them on their way. And the scriptures say that for such thought, they were men of Belial. David responds in verses 23 and 24 saying this, Ye shall not do so, my brethren, with that which the Lord hath given us, who hath preserved us and delivered the company that came against us into our hand. For who will hearken unto you in this matter? But as his part is that goeth down to battle, so shall his part be that tarrieth by the stuff. They shall part alike. David gives them a different perspective here. That God had blessed them by giving them back all and more than what they had lost. That it was a day of rejoicing. These men were not lazy men. They were weary men. They were not men that chose not to go because they were lazy. They were men that could not go on because of physical limitations. Yet they performed a valuable service still. They stayed with the stuff. They did what was best for the group as a whole. So David stated that the man who stayed would receive an equal portion with the men who went. That they would divide the blessings that the Lord had given to them equally. And the text goes on to say in verse 25 that this became policy in Israel from that point on. That that was official military policy. And here David shows once again, as when he and his men came to Ziklag, that he was going to do what was right in spite of the circumstances. In his decision, David reflected equity, showing that contributions are worthy of their reward. In every area of life, there are those who are on the front lines. There are those who are making the decisions. There are those who do the grunt work. There are those who get the credit. But behind every frontline soldier, there is somebody maintaining a supply line, right? Behind every person that is able to go the distance, there's some people that, through no necessary fault of their own, whether it's a different function or whether it's a different capability, can't do what you do. Behind every starting quarterback, there's a second stringer who's worked and studied and tried just as hard to be prepared for the game. Behind every pastor, there are men and women who serve, serve him, serve the church, take things off of his plate, do the grunt work, uphold him in prayer. And the idea is this, that the man who had to stay with the stuff is no less worthy than the man who went and fought the battle. And the reward for the men who stayed with the stuff was going to be equal with those who fought the battle. As I consider this concept, and I speak to you this morning, You know, there are many people here that have different functions in the church and in the body of Christ. Your face may not be the face that people see on our YouTube channel. Your voice may not be the voice people hear on our website. Those who come and go on Sunday mornings may never see the work that you do. But as David reflects upon the character of God here, he reflects that the rewards that God gives don't just stop at the ones who are on the front lines. The most visible, the most vocal. These men were, were a part of the battle. They were a part of the army. They played a role. They stopped at the limitations that they had. David says, that's okay. It's okay. There's still a place for them in the spoil. But David had one more action to take. Not only did he divide the spoil equally among the 600 men, but notice what else he did in verse 26. When David came to Ziklag, he sent the spoil unto the elders of Judah, 
even to his friend, saying, Behold, a present for you of the spoil of the enemies of the Lord. David also spent, sent spoil to the elders of Judah, the scriptures tell us. And the text um, gives a list of the cities as it continues um, in verses 27, 28, 29, 30, and 31. Bethel, Ramoth, Jatir, Eroer, Sifmoth, Eshtemoa, Rachal, the Jeremielites, um, the Kenites, Orma, Korshan, Atak, and Hebron. Now those names don't mean a whole lot to us, but after that, the text says in verse 31, and to all the places where David himself and his men were wont to haunt. All the places when David was in Judah where he found himself, where he regularly went. At the time of David's fleeing, he didn't have a whole lot of opportunity to requite people for their kindness. But just because he didn't have opportunity at the time doesn't mean he didn't remember their kindness. And when it became within his capacity to bless those that had blessed him, he proactively sought to bless them. David gave back the kindness which they had shown to him as he was able. And in all of these circumstances, as we consider them together, as we consider the final legacy of David in 1 Samuel, we see it as a legacy of a man who acted even in the difficult circumstances with godliness, with kindness, with justice, with equity. He didn't enfold into himself and think about himself and wallow in himself and worry himself and, and, and go his own way. He constantly sought back to the Lord. What would God have him to do? How would God have him to act? Uh, he, he, he actually besought the Lord and said, God, I'm listening. What do you want me to do? And God told him what he wanted him to do. He, he reflected God's character in how he distributed the spoil. He reflected God's character in giving back to those that had given to him. He maintained this loyalty to the character of God. So we've considered our final thoughts within this book about David. We now turn our mind in chapter 31 towards Saul's final day. And it's not pretty. Recall last time we were with Saul in 1 Samuel 28. He was being told by the disembodied spirit of Samuel, which had been brought up by the witch at Endor, that he was going to die in this battle. David is off avenging himself of the Amalekites because they burned Ziklag. And while he's doing that, a battle is taking place between the Philistines and the Israelites in the Valley of Jehoshaphat. And the text doesn't beat around the bush at all here. Notice right there, chapter 31, verse 1 says, Now the Philistines fought against Israel, and the men of Israel fled from before the Philistines and fell down slain in Mount Gilboa. This is everything Saul feared it would be, everything that Samuel, the disembodied spirit of Samuel, said would happen. Israel fell down, they, they were slain, they were routed. And the text continues in verses 2 and 3. And the Philistines followed hard upon Saul and upon his sons. And the Philistines slew Jonathan and Abinadab and Malchishua, Saul's sons. And the battle went sore against Saul, and the archers hit him, and he was sore wounded of the archers. So the armies of Israel flee. The Philistines chase down and they kill Saul's sons, who fought at his side. And the three sons mentioned are Jonathan, Abinadab, and Malchishua. All that being said, we who have walked through the book together might take a moment uh, and consider the man Jonathan. He was a godly man who loved the Lord, a man of faith who did what was right. The last time we encountered him in the book was in 1 Samuel 23. And at that time, he had snuck out to, to meet David while David was in the woods, in the wilderness of Ziph. And as he was sitting with David for that brief time, he was envisioning the time when David was king and he was able to stand at David's right hand. You remember that? He was envisioning that opportunity. He says, you'll be king, and I'll be standing right there next to you. That was not to come to pass, as David would never again see his best friend. Jonathan fell at the side of his father, fighting the battle that his father asked him to fight, submitting himself to the authorities that were over him, doing what was right. And uh, we see again another very unfortunate and unnecessary loss in, in the nation of Israel due to Saul's disobedience. A, a man, a great man of God was lost on that day. 
Saul flees as well, and the text tells us he was hit by archers. Now, he wasn't killed. He was only wounded. Being caught alive was perhaps the worst thing that could happen to a king in that day. Typically, as, as we know from various other instances where kings and, and great men were caught in Scripture, you think of perhaps Samson in the book of the Judges, or even what, um, what Saul had done to uh, King Agag. The kings would be caught, and they would have oftentimes their thumbs cut off so they could never hold a sword again, and their eyes pierced out so that they could never see again. Everything that would make them a capable man, a warrior, and a leader would be removed from him, so that he, and then he would be humbled. And he would oftentimes stay in the courts of the kings of their enemies and become a laughingstock, become a, a jester, spend the rest of his days as an animal, basically, to be abused. Saul, everything we know about him is that he was an extremely proud man, of course, right? And he wasn't interested, just as he had kept control of his life, he was now interested in keeping control of his death. So he commands his armor bearer to draw his sword and to kill him, rather than suffer the indignity of torture. His armor bearer, however, would not do it. His armor bearer was probably a, a man that understood, like David did, that no man can kill the Lord's anointed without consequence. God has a way, right? He has an economy. He has a way in which he works. And, and, and even, if, even if Saul requested that you kill him, you can't kill the Lord's anointed without consequences. That's how God works. So he says, no, I won't do it. So Saul um, does what he would do. His final act of faithlessness. He draws his own sword and he falls upon his own sword. Saul's armor bearer sees the king is dead and then he falls on his own sword as well and they both die there on the battlefield. So we read in chapter 31 verses 6 and 7, so Saul died and his three sons and his armor bearer and all his men that same day together. And when the men of Israel that were on the other side of the valley and they that were on the other side Jordan saw that the men of Israel fled and that Saul and his sons were dead. They forsook the cities and fled and the Philistines came and dwelt in them. That's the legacy of a proud man. The legacy of a disobedient man. First Chronicles 10 gives us a parallel account to this account. And in verses 13 and 14 we, dis, uh, we see it described this way. So Saul died for his transgressions which he committed against the Lord even against the word of the Lord, which he kept not, and also for asking counsel of one that had a familiar spirit to inquire of it, and inquired not of the Lord. Therefore he slew him and turned the kingdom unto Je David, the son of Jesse. So First Chronicles gives us the spiritual reasons for Saul's death. The physical reasons, of course, was the battle and his own faithlessness. The, the spiritual reasons are because he was a disobedient man. He refused to submit himself to the Lord. We continue reading in 1 Samuel 31, beginning in verse 8. And it came to pass on the morrow when the Philistines came to strip the plain that they found Saul and his three sons fallen in Mount Gilboa. And they cut off his head and stripped it off his armor and sent into the land of the Philistines round about to publish it in the house of their idols and among the people. And they put his armor in the house of Ashtaroth. And they fastened his body to the wall of Bethshan. And when the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead heard of it, excuse me, heard of that which the Philistines had done to Saul, all the valiant men arose and went all night and took the body of Saul and the bodies of his sons from the wall of Bethshan and came to Jabesh and burnt them there. And they took their bones and buried them under a tree at Jabesh and fastened, excuse me, and fasted seven days. So Saul was dead, uh, but they still found his body, and they found the body of his sons. And we read a, a parallel of this account again in 1 Chronicles chapter 10. They cut off his head, they took his armor, they took uh, it off of him, and they, they paraded his armor throughout the land. And the armor eventually found a resting place in the house of Ashtaroth. Now the idea here is this. Our God is better than their God. That's what they're saying. They took... Saul's armor, they hung it in the house of their God. This was, this was their ode to their God. Ashtaroth, you gave us victory in this battle. David's sin 
Now, I mean, excuse me, Saul's sin not only had consequences upon himself, but it, his sin scorned the name of the Lord in, in, in the eyes of the Lord's enemies. And then they took him and they cut off his head, and, and the scriptures will tell us that the, the, his, his son's bodies were also hung. They hung them over the wall of the city Beth Shan as a statement. This is what happens to the enemies of the Philistines. But there were still some valiant men left in Israel. The scriptures tell us that one such group, men of Jabesh Gilead, so the city of Jabesh in the land of Gilead, which was on the other side of Jordan, the east side of Jordan, they were sickened by the indignity that was done to God and to God's anointed. And so they arose at night and they went into the city, they went into the land of the Philistines to the city of Beth Shan. And they retrieved Saul's body as well as the bodies of his sons. And scriptures tell us that they burned them there in Jabesh Gilead. And then they took the bones and they buried them under a tree. And they, they fasted in mourning seven days for their king. In these last two chapters, as we have considered them together, we've considered two men who took very different paths, didn't they? And the results of their lives become a cautionary tale to us of the dangers of disobedience, but also the incredible opportunities and blessings of obedience. And I'd like for us to consider this cautionary tale through the lens of some important proverbs as we apply our, in our time together today. And the first proverb I would like us to read is one that's repeated twice in Scripture, in the Proverbs. Proverbs 14.12 and Proverbs 16.25. The two Proverbs say the same thing, and they say this. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. The message of these two verses is that in any given instance, there is God's way of doing something, and there is man's way of doing something. God's way speaks of that which aligns with him, with God, with his will, with his character, with his word. Man's way speaks of that which is opposite to God's will, his character, and his word. And in every circumstance, no matter how benign the choice, there is a way that's, that, that, that's God's way, that's, that's the best way, and there's a way that's not. In Saul, we see a man whose actions make every bit of sense from man's perspective, right? I mean, as you think of Saul's actions throughout his life, his actions really make sense in, in, in the spectrum of, uh, from a human perspective. He defends his right to rule. He's the king, right? He sees a threat to his kingdom. He defends his right to rule by chasing this man, David. He sought to destroy those who threatened his throne. He led his people to the very best that his mind and his body has allowed him. He's fought his people's enemies. He's sought to establish dominance for his kingdom. He's made the decisions which he deemed best under the circumstances. But all of Saul's decisions followed a general template. He walked in the way that seemed right to him. And as we read today, it brought him to death. There is a way which seems right to man, but the end is the way of death. You're a human, which means there is a way that seems right to you that will end in, 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 in that which is not. In David, we see a man whose actions don't make sense from a, from a human perspective, right? When you think about his life thus far, it doesn't make sense. He stood against the giant Goliath, and instead of coming with armor on, in the power of his might, he came in the power of the Lord. God vindicated him, and he vindicated himself at the hand of David. David had several chances to kill the man that wanted him dead, and to take the throne that God had promised him. That would be a nice shortcut, right? Stop hiding in caves, stop running, just... Kill the man. He's going to die anyway. Take the throne. You're going to get it anyway. We talked about that in Sunday school this morning, right? That's what Jacob did. Just steal the blessing because you're going to get it anyway. David could have done that too. But he didn't. Because God said not to. So he didn't. David could have lived in Moab outside of Saul's authority for the entire time of his exile. But God told him, no, get back into Judah. Judah. 
His soldiers didn't like it. It didn't make sense from a material perspective. It wasn't efficient. It wasn't safe. But he did it because God told him to. Now David faltered on many occasions, right? He runs to Nob, to Ahimelech. He lies to Ahimelech. Ahimelech and his entire family is killed. He didn't trust the Lord. He tried to do it his own way. Ahimelech suffers. Later, David despaired and he fled to Gath. He spent 18 months outside of Israel. He nearly had to fight his own people. His, the, the city of Ziklag was burned. Anything but blessing in that time. But even in our passage today, in 1 Samuel 30, David kept coming back to God's way. When he realized he did it wrong, he didn't solve his own problems. He, he repented and he got back to the Lord's way. He distributed it to the men the spoil as God would have him. He was generous. He was just. He was fair. God's way. And, and he was blessed. Even when it doesn't make sense, even when it seems as though it presents you at a, at a disadvantage, God's way leads to life and peace. Man's way leads to death and destruction. Every time. And there is a way. There is a way which seems right unto a man, but the end thereof is the ways of death. Our next set of Proverbs, Proverbs 16.2 and Proverbs 21.2. Scriptures tell us this, All the ways of a man are clean in his own eyes, but the Lord weigheth the spirits. Proverbs 21.2, Every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord pondereth the hearts. Mankind is deeply susceptible to self-deception. We have the capacity to justify almost any action. And we have the capacity to deceive ourselves deeply. And as Christians, we must be careful that what we perceive to be God's way actually is God's way. And it's not our way dressed up as God's way. Because we will, will be tempted. As you're praying and you're asking the Lord for guidance and God guides you because He does... Into, your, into His will. We need to make sure that it is His will and not God's will or our will that we've wrapped God into. We're tempted to pinpoint what we want and then manipulate our understanding of God and His Word to conform to our desire. Rather than reading the, believing the Bible, rather than praying and listening to the Holy Spirit, to come to God's way. We can be tempted to start with our way and then try to justify this way through biblical principle. This is very common among believers. And it's a trap that you need to be warned against and you need to guard yourself against. Guard yourself against when you're seeking the Lord's will through His Word, when you're seeking the Lord's will through prayer and the Spirit of God, against having a conclusion that you want and so wrapping God around it, because that's what Saul tried to do. He took his will and he gave it a godly veneer. He would tell uh, he, um, the, the men of Belial who followed him, Blessed be thou of the Lord, you've had mercy upon your king. The Lord will bless you for this. He was promising blessings to those who would go along with his rebellion and saying, the Lord will bless you for going along with, with my rebellion. He was wrapping his will up in, in a biblical veneer, in a godly veneer, and pursuing his way in God's name. And we can do that. See, because there's a way that seems right unto a man. All the ways of a man, in fact, are clean in his own eyes. You, you don't do it unless you think it's good for you. I mean, you pursue it because it's what you want. But you know, the Lord weighs the spirits. These verses warn us that God ponders the heart. God will not be fooled by your self-deception. God will not bless you simply on the basis that you have convinced yourself or perhaps even others that the way you want to go is what God wants of you. Saul sought for spiritual confirmation of his selfish choices, but they led to death. The duty of man is not to wrap God around our will and way. It's not to seek to justify our way biblically. The duty of man is to wrap our will around God's way. To seek out God's way. This is the distinguishing mark. 
Are you doing your will and wrapping God around it? Trying to justify your will with godly perspectives? Or are you actually seeking God's will and wrapping your actions around it? See, and then here's the thing. Saul, all the while he was doing his own will in the name of God, was making human choices. Choices that made perfect human sense. Choices that any, any heathen would have made. He just put God in front of it, right? But David was making the hard choices that, that clearly reflected the character of God. He was giving what he didn't have to give because God told him to give. He was going places that he didn't have to go, places that were more dangerous to him because God told him to go there. He was waiting on God's timing, God's timing which could have been thwarted in several cases in order to get to the throne faster, but he was waiting on God. His decisions bore the marks not of him taking his will and doing it in the name of God, but him taking God's will and doing God's will. Only when we wrap our will around God's will do we find God's blessing. Do we find true success. And I wonder if there are not some of us here this morning who have fallen into this trap. That you've gone your own way. You've done things according to your own understanding. You've done them in the name of God. You've sought for biblical justification for your actions. And yet, you're bearing the marks of one who is not being blessed by the Lord. You've gone in a pa that path that makes sense to you, and yet you found no blessing. You found no contentment. You've, you've found no marks, no spiritual marks that you're headed in the right direction. You've done that which was right in your own eyes, and maybe you found ways, as I've mentioned, to justify it biblically, but they aren't actually God's ways. They're just your ways wrapped up in spiritual language. The scriptures tell us we can know God's way. We can know it. We can know God's will. God's word is the lamp unto our feet and the light unto our path. God's spirit speaks to us and tells us the way that we should go. Not extra biblical revelation. Guidance. Direction. Oftentimes, the only thing standing between us and God's way is our way. We have every possible spiritual advantage that has been given to us. But are we taking it? That was Saul. Saul was a man, for, the mo for most of his life, he was not openly defiant to God. Saul didn't outright blaspheme God's way or God's leading. But what Saul did do is seek to fit God into his own will. And as we close the book of 1 Samuel, we find that though Samuel's way seemed right in his own eyes, the end thereof was the way of death. We can follow the Lord through his word, through prayer, through the leading of the Holy Spirit, telling us the way that we should go. Or we can follow our way and wrap it up in biblical language. And while they might sound the same when we talk about them, the results will be diametrically opposed. So have you found this to be true in your own life or do you suspect this to be true in your own life? Can you point to instances in your life where, yeah, you know, maybe I, I wrapped that in biblical language but that was my own way. Or maybe you're in circumstances right now and things aren't going how you would expect according to the Lord. Uh, you're not seeing the promises that you know God has for you come to pass. Well, maybe it's time to reassess whether or not you're actually going God's way or whether you're going your way wrapped in God's language. So you get down on your knees and you ask God to tell you and the Holy Spirit of God speaks. I mentioned, it's not, it's not that he's, he's giving you that which is contradicting the Word of God. He's not giving you extra biblical revelation in regard to new inspiration. What he's, what he's doing is he's guiding you. He's leading you through his Spirit. That, that should be normal for a Christian life. That should be expected. And then you confirm that through the multitude of counselors. Godly men and women who will confirm what the Spirit is guiding you in. 
And of course, you, you, you confirm it with the Word of God. You pray the prayer that David prayed in Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Make sure that your motives are pure. Make sure that you, you, you have reduced, eliminated your will in the matter, right? So that you can pursue God's will entirely. And as we do so, He will be faithful. And you will find... Now, there's no promise to the believer of material success in this life, right? We've seen the, the testimony of believers throughout time, martyrs and persecution and great lack and want. And yet, we know the promises of God. Matthew 6.33 that if we seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, all these things will be added unto us. Take no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. He said that we will be clothed, we will be fed, we will be provided for with the necessities of life. He demonstrates the, the spiritual blessings upon the man who has aligned himself with the will of God. If you're not seeing that, if you're not finding the joy and the peace and the contentment that comes from being in the will of God, if you're not seeing Him guide and lead you, well then, maybe you've fallen into a little bit of Saul. Where you've got the language right. You've got the idea. But you've gone your way. Your will instead of God's. May God help us to know the difference. And may God help each of us to align ourselves with His will for His glory. Let's pray. Father, thank You for the Word of God and for teaching us this morning through it. I pray that Your Holy Spirit would take the words of God and, and apply them to each of our hearts in the necessary way in order that each of God's people can can be in a place where they are following your will and reaping the spiritual blessings of that. Lord, we know that your word tells us that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. We know your word tells us that it is not by might nor by power, but by your spirit. I pray that we as your people would stop trying to do it by might and by power, by our own understanding, knowing that there is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof is the way of death, knowing that every way of man is right in his own eyes, but you are the one that weighs the spirits. You are the one that, that knows the heart. Father, help us to remember that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And, and, and who can know it, much less us? Please humble us before your will. Please help us not to be like Saul. And, and to whatever degree we are, to whatever degree we take your will and try to accomplish it our way, please teach us how to actually seek your will and your way for your glory and our best good. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.